Uh, hello, uh, and welcome to GCS's annual independent study TEDx talk. Our independent study course is specifically designed to give our students the opportunity to commit to a year-long study of a suitable topic with the understanding that at the end of the year, the product of their study will demonstrate their critical thinking skills and writing abilities while giving them an experience that will prepare them for higher level academic research. This study is largely self-directed. Students are given completion milestones to meet and are offered the opportunity to learn key necessary skills, but they are largely responsible for the direction of the paper and students are asked to identify an apparent problem within their realm of influence and to commit to studying towards a potential solution to that problem. They are guided both by myself through the class and also through a mentor they connect with who is an expert in the, in the area of study. Today, I'm excited to introduce our 2023 independent study student. T.Y. Shum has worked hard throughout the year. This paper sprung from his interest in engineering and its applications within society. He has been mentored throughout the year by Dr. Gary Evans. Dr. Evans holds an MBA from the University of Windsor, as well as a PhD in corporate governance from Liverpool John Moores University. He is also the, currently the Dean of Faculty of Indigenous Knowledge, Education, Research, and Applied Studies at UPEI. Along with Dr. Evans' mentorship, today on our panel we will have um, Mr. Beach, who holds an MA in Education from Liberty University and is our head of school. Pastor Jeff Eastwood is the leader, lead pastor of Grace Baptist Church and holds a Bachelor of, Edu of Arts in Theology from Northlands Bible College. And finally, we have Jonathan Shute. Jonathan is a special, special projects manager at Bulk Carriers. He studied business and theology at Crandall University, as well as receiving an MA in theological studies from Tyndale Seminary. Jonathan is also an alumni of GCS. Throughout this year, TY's expertise in his area of study has grown. As his independent study coordinator, it has been encouraging to see his growth as an academic using his creativity and criticality in tandem to identify new connections and possibilities. I am proud to present to you T.Y. Shum as he presents his paper titled Cobots and PEI Hospitality, a Feasibility Study. Test, test, this is mic on. Okay, so hello everyone. As Mr. Allen here has uh, introduced me, I'm T.Y. and I'll be talking about the uh, feasibility of automation in PEI's hospitality industry from a social and economic perspective as well as a possible solution to labor shortages on PEI. So let's get started here. In 2022, the uh, federal government has released a report that labeled uh, issues in uh, our, uh, as I was saying, the federal government in 2022 uh, published a report that hi outlined major labor shortages across Prince Canada as a whole. The unemployment to job vacancy ratio in Canada dropped to a historical low of 1.4 compared to the ratio of 2.6 in 2020. This labor shortage issue has uh, expected to affect 46.3% 46 of businesses involved in accommodation and food services, otherwise known as the hospitality industry throughout Canada. Although this, uh, this statistic does vary amongst uh, certain provinces, which I'll get into in importance later. Now, with rising concerns of worker shortages across PEI's labor market and Canada as a whole, there have been many, many ideas have been discussed to fix the issue, with one such idea being job automation. In fact, we are seeing this being done in some capacity with self-serve kiosks at supermarkets and restaurants, such as fast food chains. But another novel idea that is often brought up since sci-fi shows and, off, and more recently now with current advancements in technology is the use of mobile robotics or specifically cobots in the hospitality industry. So what is a cobot and how is it different from traditional robotics? Let's start by going over what a traditional robotic robot in business uh, are. Traditional robots such as industrial robots you see in factories and warehouses are designed to work on repeating work with minimal to no deviation in place of human workers. This means that they're often built to work in enclosed spaces and they uh, are difficult to reprogram and adapt to new situations, although they're very efficient at single tasks in closed areas. 
uh, cobots differ from traditional robotics here in that they're designed to work with humans in that to different environments. In fact, the term cobot itself is short for collaborative robotics, which is to work in tandem with people. Now, the use of cobots in the hospitality industry, particularly restaurants, began as far back as the 1980s when a restaurant in California uh, started to employ two robotic waiters to serve food. Since then, advancements in technology have allowed service robots to become increasingly commonplace and more complex throughout the world. One such example would be the Flippy 2 robot designed by Meso Robotics. This robot, as you see in the picture here, uh, could prepare about 60 frying baskets per hour and be, pro be programmed to prepare certain foods, and such as onion rings, burgers, and chicken, or other fast foods, depending on what you serve at your restaurant. Now, this robot itself has been uh, employed in different locations across uh, the United States already, with one such example being uh, White Castle, which has employed 100 of these across its different establishments across uh, the United States. Now, the robot itself uh, is not a paid-for service, but it's rather rented out for $3,000 a month as a robot as a service uh, system. However, there have also been other instances of robots which are actually bought instead of rented, and those are also starting to be seen across uh, different establishments in, across the world. Now, another example of robots working in the hospitality industry, in this case, hotels, is the Hena Hotel, which is located in Japan. The hotel was first established in Nagasaki in 2015 and became the first hotel to mostly staff robots in the workforce, consisting of a labor force of 243 robots that carried out roles ranging from reception to room service. The hotel itself was created partially in response to societal issues in Japan related to its growing tourist industry as well as the uh, declining population in the country as demands increase. Oh, none the However, there is evidence that the technology itself is not perfect yet despite being commonplace as the robot chain itself, the hotel chain itself has retired about half its workforce in 2019 because of technical issues that occur from a large amount of automation. We'll get back to why this is important in a bit, because this does play a part in determining how feasible this will be in Prince Edward Island. Nonetheless, the two current examples shown here, Flippy 2 and the Hannah Hotel, are only few of the increasing amounts of robots being employed in hospitality services globally as automation becomes more commonplace. So, the technology has been proven to exist and be usable but do they bring any benefits to PEI uh, businesses themselves, or do they even help solve the labor shortage issue? After all, just because we can do it with the technology doesn't mean we should without thinking through. So this is where the economic and social impact comes in. Let's start with how cobots can financially impact businesses. Now, with this, what we would do is compare the uh, ac initial acquisition costs of cobots with the amount a business can make in uh, a year, depending on how they go. Now, with this, let's talk about how, cobot, how much cobots themselves cost first. So, a cobot price itself can range overall from $10,000 to $35,000, with your lower price cobots being $10,000 to $20,000, and your medium cost being $20,000 to $35,000. Those two will be the first two, the main categories we'll be focusing on, as the higher tier cobots you see up here, $35,000, are not seen as uh, necessary to our demands on Prince Edward Island. Now, to compare salary, we took information from the government website itself, and we did some calculations here, which you'll see. Now, with the hospitality industry, it's split into two parts, the tourism and the food and accommodation industry. And you notice that there is a difference between those two. Actually, there's four differences, which I'll explain. So your average monthly wage for tourism is around $3,000, while your average monthly wage for the food and accommodation industry is $2,000. Now, as you guys probably know, there are businesses on Prince Edward Island that don't open year-round, but also from just summer, from six months to 
just one year only and stop. So from this, we could tell, we split the cost into the seasonal wage and the annual wage. For our annual wage here, we, for tourism, we get around $38,000 per year. And for accommodation and food, we get $25,000 per year. Meanwhile, for seasonal wages, we get around uh, $19,000 per year, $19, per year. And for food and accommodation services on Prince Edward Island, we get a seasonal wage of $12,000 per year. $13,000 per year if you round it up. Now, if you were to compare this to the cost of cobots, you could see that at the very base minimum, most hospitality businesses can break even in a minimum of half a year. However, if we were to add some realistic perspective here, such as like uh, deployment costs, software, and such, that would raise this up to uh, different numbers depending on what business you're looking at, specifically if it's seasonal or annual. Now, with the now with year-round businesses, they'll be even they'll be able to break even and begin making profit in less than a year because of the high profits they make on both food and tourism businesses. However, for seasonal businesses, this is a much more riskier and long-term investment, considering they take around three to five year, two to three years of consistent income before profit can be made. Now, when I say consistent income, this is where another issue comes in. With all of these numbers, they depend on at least two factors. One is that they don't account for long-term costs, such as maintenance and power requirements. Now, the reality is, because there is currently no demand for robot maintenance or similar services on Prince Edward Island, all of the maintenance will have to be outsourced to external provinces and even outside the country, which would raise costs up and also fluctuate depending on who you're, uh, which business you're talking with and who owns the cobot. Now, uh, it's expected that if we were to introduce cobots into the PI's businesses, then the prices could be driven down for maintenance as demand goes up and business start appearing on Prince Edward Island. But that's just a very small, uh, assumption. The bigger assumption in this number is, as I was talking about, consistent income. Now, as you guys all know, uh, hospitality businesses are service businesses, service industries, and those mostly derive their uh, income from customers, people, because they provide services to people through food, tourism, entertainment, so on and so forth. Now, with Prince Edward Island here, uh, tourism is actually a major business, with uh, cultural tourism being the most major one. Cultural tourism is when tourists arrive to a place to study their uh, the place's history and way of life, their culture, which, if you're to factor in new technology, such as cobots in this case, could cause issues because uh, certain tourists would have expectations of what places like Prince Edward Island looks like, and if you were to introduce new technology, such as, say, cobots, into businesses, you're solely served by cobot in a restaurant on Prince Edward Island, then you probably not expect that expectation, and you likely not return have a bad review of this. And if you don't return, that means the business loses income because they're no longer getting any customers. Now, another aspect you probably notice up here is this section that I talked about with a lack of localized studies. This goes back to the 2022 report that I was talking about. Now, the, specifically the 2022 labor shortage report I was talking about in the first slide. With this one, the main issue that we could talk about that shows up here is that there's a lack of data that even signifies that, that shows that we need this solution to begin with because if, yeah. because, um, a lot of the news articles that you often see highlighting the issues of labor shortages across businesses on Prince Edward Island are mostly based on anecdotal references and lack any research, any empirical data. So with that, we can't exactly show what is needed, how we can approach this solution. In fact, if you look at provincial sources as of early 2023, 
you see a report that outlines growing a labor force with a 91% increase of employment and accommodation in food services, which actually suggests that even if it's slowly improving, it's still the labor shortage issue on Prince Edward Island is still an improving matter. So in general, cobots are technically not needed, but we'll still keep going on here. So in addition to customers here, we also have another factor that we had to talk about, which is employees, right? Because we don't have any cobots here on the biz on Prince Edward Island, right? So who else is going to man the kiosks? Who else is going to man the self-serve, right? It's going to be human employees. Now, human employees also run into similar problems, albeit slightly different from your cultural tourism counterparts, hu customers, human customers, basically what I'm saying, which is uh, the issue of ethics, actually, in this case. Now, with uh, with human with employees in the hospitality industry as a whole, you are. Uh, and also as a business in general with automation involved, you often hear stories of how people are concerned about how automation will take over people's jobs. Who here has heard of that? Yeah, most of you. You have probably heard those stories of how people complain robots, computers, et cetera, et cetera, will take over jobs, will be homeless, so on and so forth. This is the next issue we talk about. And in fact, it's not just with cobots, robots nowadays. It's a historical trend that's been going on since we invented a wheel, basically. So here's some examples of historical trends where similar things have happened. In the early industrial in English Industrial Revolution, when uh, textile mills and uh, steam engines in pre increased production through automation, you had people that were fearing that uh, automation would worsen their working conditions and allow factory workers to abuse them by lowering wages. In response, many people decide to band together and uh, protest against this by disrupting uh, production, by destroying equipment in uh, factories. Now, as you guys all, if you guys know what the term Luddite is, you probably now associate the term with uh, technophobia, or specifically the fear of technology. And this also plays in a stereotype which overlooks the whole uh, abuse and protest part, and it paints the image that Luddites were often just there to destroy technology because they're against it, basically cavemen. Now, another uh, historical trend, more recent one in fact, that we see that ties in closer to your whole old people don't know how to use internet stereotype is actually the electronic data processing or what happened in the 1950s to 1960s and all the way up until the early 20th cent 21st century when computers began to replace branch-level paperwork, file cabinets, paper, if you guys, are you guys old enough to <laughs> remember that? Yeah, so it's around this time when uh, mainframes, not just your, it's not your laptops, it's like basically a room-sized computer filled with vacuum tubes, but still computers nonetheless, that began to replace branch-level paperwork with uh, uh, mainframes, giant computers in uh, businesses that could automate uh, paperwork in Pay, pay wages and all that. So with this introduction of uh, computers in the workplace offices, the workplace became divided from uh, one side to believing that mainframes, computers, could increase productivity and efficiency, which is also the general argument that we have our, for most modern technology today, right? Even, comp even robots, you often hear people saying that robots can improve efficiency in workplaces. However, there is also a second side, which goes back to what you similar here in the Luddite movement here, where people believe that computers will replace humans unless workers and government intervenes, friends, stops businesses from doing so, or at least put restrictions on them. Now, with those two historical trends, what we see is similar one with Prince Edward Island, particularly with how strong cultural tourism plays a part in our hospitality industry. To solve to figure out this uh, answer to this question, I hosted a survey uh, asking everyone their general consensus on cobots on Prince Edward Island, and I spread this through social media to gather participants. Now, as you see here, surprisingly, uh, most of the opinion is actually pretty neutral. It's 35.4% neutral, although it's kind of hard to see there, sorry. and. Uh, 
if you look at the other side here, you could actually see that people are surprisingly leaning more towards the supportive side of cobots, contrary to what people think here. However, when you ever you split this into age groups, it gets more interesting. You notice that if you were to split the opinions of cobots into age groups, you actually see something similar to the historical trends, such as the co uh, Luddite movement and the computer revolution in the 20th century. You notice that the earlier generations, the age 18 to 24, 25 to 29, have a more negative uh, opinion on cobots compared to your older generations. While I haven't found credible sources that have uh, confirmed this formally, I hypothesize that this is because of the fear of job security and similar fears that you would see from earlier similar trends, such as, say, reduced wages because the cobot taken over your job, and so on and so forth. While it's not the same with older generations because they already have established job security, they've basically, they're close to retirement, right? So there's no really that much of that fear to replace them. So overall, all of these though, however, do present a uh, historical, pattern, historical pattern that uh, you could see through uh, the Industrial Revolution, the 20th century, and now with the introduction of cobots into businesses such as hospitality and potentially here in the future, which is this loop here. Now, it starts as uh, step one here where you have a new development in whatever industry that shifts it radically. For example, uh, you have steam engines that shift the uh, factories in, industri in the Industrial Revolution and it gets uh, widely adopted. Then you have technophobia and hesitancy, which is where people start fearing that this new technology will uh, cause them to be obsolete and be replaced, which also leads to revolution or resistance where people advocate against this technology or advocate for some control over it from the government. Now, at some point, the technology may or may not become widespread, oftentimes becoming widespread, as you see with computers, and uh, the resistance dies down and becomes a minority. Now, with that, there's always going to be some uh, remaining resistance, even like up till now, and that resistance eventually becomes a stereotype generalization, which is what I mentioned about the whole Luddite movement, its current definition, as well as the whole old man can't use electronics stereotype that you hear about today, right? So what I propose here, in addition to its uh, cobalt feasibility on Prince Edward Island, is that the, we are seeing a similar loop here with cobots or younger generations where the younger generation now, you guys, may in the future be seen as people who can't interact with automated services in say hospitality or even any other job depending on how widespread this gets. So overall with uh, the whole financial analysis as well as the social analysis here, are cobots feasible or doable here in uh, Prince Edward Island, and should we use them? With your financial uh, analysis, we have concluded that they are a feasible option because we could uh, start employing them after a year or so. Well, well, we could employ them immediately, but they would start making a profit after a year, and businesses would also uh, gain benefit from that financially. However, the fin the social aspect of this, the historical loop, and also the whole cultural tourism thing we talked about, also demonstrates that uh, balance is needed in uh, implement implementation of cobots and also new technology as a whole. For Prince Edward Island, we, uh, we as both the government and business owners have to uh, decide carefully on how we implement this through uh, different uh, plans and also how we can support anyone who potentially gets hurt by these technologies such as anyone who gets laid off which is something we don't want to do as as you saw back there our current public opinion is neutral but it could be tipped off through one way or another. Now there are also additional factors that we must address whenever we're implementing new technology such as cobots here on Prince Edward Island which goes back to the lack of data for uh, labor shortages. Uh, despite our, despite federal reports that state that we have 
this information, we also have to start report. We also have to uh, start our own studies uh, provincially, locally, to gather more information from a local scale, to determine how we could introduce how we could introduce new technology and a better approach to uh, better uh, earn public trust with new technologies such as cobots in the hospitality industry. So, in conclusion, really. It's not a matter of if we can employ cobots into the hospitality industry. It's more of a matter of when we do it and how we proceed. And thank you very much for your presentation. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, T.Y. We're going to hand the mic yeah. down to each of our panelists, and if you guys could ask, uh, if you have a question or a comment, it would be really appreciated. Thank you so much, T.Y. I really appreciated your paper and your presentation and all your research. Um, one of the thing, a couple of things, I found it surprising that it was the older generation that seemed to be either neutral or accepting, and, and more the younger generation that wasn't. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also really appreciated your uh, view to the cultural aspect of our particular brand of tourism. Right. Um, what I'm wondering is, would it be possible to uh, gather the thoughts of non-islanders as to the introduction of cobots if one of the main reasons they're coming to PEI is to have that sort of going back in time cultural experience, if that makes sense? Uh, well, so would they not come as tourists if PEI became more modern, I guess, if for lack of a better way to put it? But. Well, the truth is PEI has always been slowly becoming modern over time. It's just, it's often perceived that we're a step back because of how we look here, right? We still have brick buildings and a green gables, wooden houses, all of art, right? Not saying that wooden houses and all that are outdated, but you get the point. But we also have uh, been recently getting new technologies in our businesses, such as, say, your Apple Pay and those, which, if you look at other businesses outside of Prince Edward Island, it's been there for a long time, and we've only been starting to get, we've only been getting them recently. So what I think here in regards to uh, outsiders coming in is, it's expected that over time, when robots become commonplace, people stopped uh, seeing them as this gimmick, which is actually some of the response that we got from the survey, and it's more of a common thing that you would just go to a restaurant and see that nowadays. So I f what I think is hap will happen uh, to uh, educate, not exactly educate, but to get more outsiders to come in without breaking that expectation is to gradually uh, introduce cobots and as it becomes more widespread everywhere else to keep that not illusion, but expectation as close to the original as possible. So say if you were to dump a lot of cobots into businesses immediately, like as of right now, that won't work out both from a financial and social perspective too, as you saw from the survey, and also historically. But if we were to gradually add them into business over, say, a span of a decade or so, people started to become more accepting of them and still come despite the whole new technology thing. That's good. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, T.Y. I, I really enjoyed this. This was a fun read. I'm actually doing some research on implementing artificial intelligence in our workplace to help handle. So, so cobots was actually a new concept to me, and I was really fascinated by this. So, so I really enjoyed it. Your research was really impressive. I have one uh, fairly quick question, and then one that might go a little bit deeper. The quick question is, are cobots seen as a one-to-one -one replacement for work uh, for, for human workers, or do they often manage to fulfill the duties of multiple human employees? In, in some of the research that you've done, for example, Flippy. Right. Uh, so with the Flippy 2 robot, it's actually expected that they would handle multiple people's work. However, uh, it's also expected that they're not going to outright replace humans compared to, say, uh, factories replacing human workers with industrial robots. Uh, what I think the expectation for cobots here is, as the name suggests, is that it's not exactly one-on-one, -on -one, but it's also one-on-one. -on -one. Not one-on-one -on -one in the sense that it's going to replace people, but one-on-one -on -one in the sense that uh, you have, say, one cobot in uh, a workplace that can handle, say, two or three people's work but then you also have a couple other workers that are able to uh, 
assist with it, program it, guide it, basically. So what I'm ex what it's expected to happen here is should cobots become more complete in the workforce, uh, humans are expected to, well, workers are expected to take more face-to-face uh, -face interaction through, say, help desk or perhaps uh, managerial roles where they manage uh, the devices that are doing the work. No, very good. Uh, and my, my other question, because it was one of the assumptions uh, in, in your methodology section, had to do with the assumption that with time, the maintenance costs and service costs of cobots would come down as we introduce right. more of them into the market here. Were you able, or do you think it's easily accessible to find what the costs would be currently as kind of, a, from a business perspective, one of the things we evaluate is barriers to entry. So the high right. cost up front, uh, is that, do you think that that's an insurmountable cost in the early days, or do you think it's just a matter of a company that's willing to take the risk and very quickly those costs would come down? I think it's a mix of both. As of a lot of emerging technologies, early adopters will be expected to pay uh, prices that typical companies uh, compared, especially com smaller PNP businesses here on Prince Edward Island, uh, would see as insurmountable. But as the technology becomes more mature and demand increases, ex it's expected that prices, startup costs, uh, acquisition, maintenance, and so forth, will go down as more demand is expected, so more services come up to uh, supplant these uh, requirements. This is amazing, T.Y., the amount of research that you've done over the past year and, and the information that you kind of fell upon in some ways with finding out that there was really not a lot of data out there and research out there on our labor shortage in certain sectors. Yeah. Uh, that's very interesting to see that you've come up with that. Um, my question falls a little bit along the line of, did you kind of further categorize, say, the service industry and hospitality even further from, say, fast food industry to s where you would go to, like, a sit-down meal and be served that way um, from the human experience? Because I think part of that social side right. is, as an islander who lives here every single day, I really could care less if I have to interact with a human when I go to P Pizza Hut or when right. I go to Domino's. And in some ways, in an industry like that, a cobot could be perfect. I hardly even, I just use my phone, I walk in, the robot does everything, I don't even need to have anybody in there, I grab my pizza and go. But it, do I want to have a true human experience when I sit down at a meal or I'm a tourist that comes and they, I want to ask them all kinds of questions. I want to have that human experience. So do you think from your perspective that we will see maybe the fast food service industry take this on quicker than say uh, an establishment that serves like full on meals and you're there for two or three hours? Oh yes, definitely. As you see, for example, with the Flippy 2, we've already seen a lot of fast food industries uh, establishing automation, cobots, to uh, do mostly cooking work and uh, while I haven't personally separated the uh, uh, restaurant businesses more specifically from fast food to your two hours or one hour stays, uh, from what I gathered from the survey participants, a lot of them seem to, uh, in addition to uh, your worker treatment and such, a lot of them also expressed concern that adding cobots and just automation in general into businesses on Prince Island would uh, remove the human factor, the face-to-face -face interactions that you would have with uh, typical human uh, waiters. So what I think here that has to happen is if we were to introduce cobots into businesses, uh, both fast food and uh, restaurants alike, then remaining employees will have to also be more human, more friendly inter in their interaction with uh, the patrons of who come to eat. Okay, good. Thank you, Mr. Allen. All right, thank you so much, T.Y., for today, and uh, I thank you guys for coming out and see. I know that this has been uh, not just a culmination of a lot of hard work, um, but sort of a celebration of nine months put into this topic of study and a lot of years of growth before that even, I think. Um, and so 
I'd love to encourage you guys out in the audience that if uh, you know, you're interested in this, if you want to talk to TY about his topic, um, or just even the process, please see him over the next couple weeks. I'm sure that he would be glad to, to speak with you. And uh, thank you again for being here and uh, for celebrating TY and this work with us. I'll gladly answer any questions, but please don't interrupt me during class. <laughs> yes, uh, um, otherwise, uh, if you guys wish you're dismissed for the day, you guys can grab your stuff and we'll see you tomorrow.